I have so many questions, but this one has been on my mind lately. Apologies if you address this in your book. I have purchased it, but not made it through yet. Why do you hold vaccines and surgery in such high regard and yet hold natural selection as the backbone of your philosophy? It seems contradictory. That being said, your podcast is literally the only thing that has offered me sanity for the past two years. Thank you so much. Um, all right. The we answer here... What? We can do this. We, we got this. Yeah. The answer here is actually really simple and hopefully very satisfying. The technologies, the medical technologies that uh, are wildly productive, that are the return on investment is very, very high, are technologies that are minimal interventions that leverage all of the stuff that natural selection has built already, right? So you have a failure mode in which you've got a, an immune system and it can fend off, in theory, any pathogen. But when it encounters a pathogen that it's never seen, the cards are stacked against it because it has to learn the formula before you die of the pathogen and or pass it on. What a good vaccine does is just simply take the information that your system would learn from, an, from a successful encounter with the virus and give it to you ahead of time, right? It's just a little bit of code, and that little bit of code takes the essentially miracle of your immune system and gives it enough of a leg up. And this has not only huge benefits for you as an individual because you start out with the information you need to defeat the pathogen, but huge benefits for your population because the thing doesn't get uh, spread. Anyway, that's an incredibly elegant intervention if it doesn't come with needless garbage like adjuvants and lipid nanoparticles and all sorts of other uh, pollutants and destructive um, uh, did I already say contaminants? But whatever. Mm -hmm. Surgery is similar. The point is, surgery is an absurd concept, but for the fact that almost every tissue in your body is capable of healing, or at least scarring over. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that when you have a failure, like your repair capacity has run away and created a tumor that's going to kill a vital organ, Selection doesn't have a good mechanism for pushing a tumor out of your body and dropping it in the outside world. A tree can actually do that, um, more or less, but a person cannot. On the other hand, the fact that a person can heal means that if we can get to the tumor and we can simply cut around it and then put you back together, you do the rest, which is like 99.99% of the actual work is done by selection. So the answer is minimal interventions in which selection is the key factor. And you can tell the same story about antibiotics. I would go at this a different way, <clears throat> which is that the standard line in evolution is that uh, selection can only see into the past, can't see into the future. So it is doing what it does based on what has happened before. And this is true so far as it goes. As we argue, I believe in the book, although we certainly argue routinely um, elsewhere, uh, that it's not entirely true because we, our brains, are the product of selection. And part of what we have we we do is we see into the future. So selection has figured out a way to see into the future, which is through human brains and to some degree through other conscious organisms' brains. Um, so selection absent that additional sort of extended phenotype level of analysis cannot it can get can get trapped on low adaptive peaks and so we can use our ability to see into the future and to basically problem solve and use the scientific method to say okay what is it what problems could we solve with our greater ability to track movement over time and predicting the future uh, that's that selection cannot you know far better if we use understanding of selection and trade-offs to not take a reductionist view and just say, I'm going to solve that symptom because I can see it and I've got the technology for it. Um, but the fact is that selection is, what do you say, um, the backbone of the philosophy, the evolutionary philosophy, but that doesn't mean it's all-powerful. It's, you know, it, it's not a god. Uh, it can be the backbone of uh, an understanding of the world without being omnipotent or omniscient, which is not. Yeah, I mean, it's also the case that that what you're saying verges on a normative statement, right? Evolution is the backbone. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean that its products are good or bad, right? If you're being chased by a tiger, that tiger is a marvelously 
uh, elegant mechanism generated by selection, but you're rooting against it, right? You'd rather that it starve than catch you. Mm -hmm. So we can say the same thing about um, pathogens. In the case of tumors, it's a different question because tumors are really a failure. Tumors, uh, with a few exceptions, are not really, um, except in a very local sense, advocating for their own interests. They are uh, what happens when you take a solution and push it to the point that it no longer works. Um, but the point is, we're not rooting for selection. Selection is the key to understanding your predicament and what you might do about it. And the technologies in question, the three, uh, surgery, antibiotics, uh, and vaccines, are, when used properly, elegant interventions with high returns on investment. Yeah, um, and, and something like bone setting is extraordinary, you know, where you would have, you know, if, if you break a long bone on the savanna, uh, and you don't have an ability to set the bone, and maybe if you don't have antibiotics with which to um, <clears throat> allay the risk of infection, you're quite likely to die. And so, you know, these these innovations do extend um, health and well-being. And two things, um, oh, it's already gone, but Chop Citizen was, I think, typing something very much like what I was saying at the point I was saying it. Uh, but then Vivian asks, however, should you not, however, should you not introduce the vaccine virus to the body in the normal way, i.e. through the nose or throat, rather than injecting directly into the blood? I think there's a lot, a, a, a lot of wisdom here, and and this is yes, this is one of the things I did. Uh, even having taken uh, Im yeah. immunobiology, this is one of the things I did not understand either because it was not understand understood when I took it back in the uh, early the 80s. 90s, late 80s, um, or because it just wasn't part of the course that I took. But that was the, at Penn, right? Yeah, yeah, in the medical schools, it was yep. a top level course taught by a really good professor, but. In any case, the, the point is immunity is highly local in the body. There are immunities that circulate everywhere, but the lungs, for example, are exactly where you want your immune response if you're fending off something that's going to get in through your lungs. And so the fact of trying to induce immunity in your arm to something that's going to get in through your lungs, you, you know, the cards are stacked against you. It's not impossible, but it's really the wrong way to go about it. Um, so yes, we, we need to think about these things. And we also need to worry about the interface between pharma and its interests yeah. and our medical well-being, because I, I hate to say it, but it's just simply true. Pharma's interest is in having things to treat that it plausibly has treatments for. It's not. Pharma has an interest in the rise of chronic conditions at some level. It, it does. And to the extent that humanity now has a chronic condition called COVID, right? That's a, um, that's a huge windfall. And were we to have addressed it early with off patent drugs or even vaccines that were inducing immunity locally so that it really didn't have community spread, right? Um, you they, mean like actual vaccines? actual vaccines with actual... As opposed to the things that are masquerading as vaccines. Right. Yeah. If we had done the right stuff, I think there's a very good likelihood we would not be stuck with permanent COVID. And um, that would have been less lucrative for certain industries that appear to have a stranglehold on policy. Indeed. Uh, so one more one more comment here. First, I want to know how you pronounce grand eight wheat? Grand wheat? Uh, so tell us in the chat if you would. Uh, but Grand Wheat, uh, which I, I'm just making that French, uh, laying here with a fresh piece of metal in the knee, I would add anesthesia to my list of great inventions along with surgery, obviously. No, that's your own weakness. <laughs> the fact is, I feel like you don't deserve any surgery that you couldn't tolerate without an anesthetic. I don't believe that at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I do admire people you know, for example, in the past or in the field who have endured these surgeries without anesthetic. Yeah. Not that they had any choice about it. No, but no. I, I hope never to be one of these people. But I, uh, I, do, I do think we all ought to just spend a few minutes with the idea, I probably ought to be that tough. You know, life can be that tough. You probably ought to be tough enough to endure that were it to come to it. And hopefully it never does. Hey guys, that was a clip from our monthly private Q&A that you can get access to at my Heather Hyang's Patreon. And you can also get access there to all of the past paid subscriber content. So please consider joining us there.
Did you mention that these private Q&As are the key to living a better life and living to tell the tale? I forgot to do that. These private Q&As are in fact the key to living a better life and what? Living to tell the tale. Living to tell the tale. Go ahead, live to tell the tale. Join us there. See ya.